Welcome to workshop one. Today I'm going to talk about the very basics of the VST DX, some basics of frequency modulation and phase modulation, and about how to program a plucked string with DX. It will be but a rough draft yet, but we will return to the matter of strings in a later workshop in this series. DX is a software clone of the Yamaha's famous DX7 synthesizer, but we can use it as a preset and file manager for original DX7 files as well. Or as a very comfortable preset editor to use with a real hardware synth. It is programmed by Digital Suburban. After downloading it, you can expand the zip file to any directory on your computer. I suggest to use a special folder for this workshop. But no matter where on your hard drive you have this zip files expanded to, no matter where the DX DLL files are, the VST always generates a so-called cartridge folder in the hidden Windows directory called App Data. I'm going to talk about the file management later, but this important fact should be said already now and here. DX consists of six identical blocks called operators. The algorithm window where we can determine which operators will modulate which other operators. An LFO section. A general pitch envelope. A main filter unit. Keyboard tuning and poly mono switch. Cartridge preset and file management, including the subsection to adjust the general parameters and communication settings, the file management menu, and the communication and general settings menu. And there is a keyboard reaching from C minus 2 up to G8. C minus 2 up to G8. In the lower left corner there is a small display showing what parameter or function your mouse pointer is actually at, or was the last your mouse pointer was at, and what value this parameter or function actually has. Every operator contains a sine wave generator, a four rate, four level envelope generator to modulate the output amplitude of the operator, the knob to adjust the modulation sensitivity, key velocity and the output level, and a quite complex keyboard scaling functionality. In the algorithm window we can choose between 32 different algorithms and the strength of the signal which is fed back in the drafted feedback loop. Well, before we start talking about the details we should deal with the VST's file management. We are going to produce a lot of presets and patches we will have to use later again, so we should know how to save and organize them. We open the door to the VST's file management by clicking the button CART. After clicking this button, three windows open. The cartridge window is the biggest one. Those who have never seen a DX7, much less worked with one, will ask why cartridge? Well, the presets of the DX7 were stored on ROM cartridges, each cartridge containing 32 presets. Each SysX file of the DX7 contained 32 presets, and so does each of the files you see in the cartridge window. The cartridge is a folder containing 32 
presets. The window below the cartridge window shows which presets the actual chosen and active cartridge contains. The cartridge DX01 is active, actually. You can't see it, so I highlight it by left-clicking on it in the cartridge window. At once, after left-clicking on a cartridge in the cartridge window, the third window on the right fills with content. Or changes its content in case it hadn't been empty before. This third window shows the content, the presets, of the highlighted cartridge in the cartridge window. It is completely identical with the window below right now, because I have highlighted the active, the loaded cartridge. But when I left-click on another cartridge in the cartridge window, the situation changes. The window at the bottom still shows the content of the loaded cartridge, of course, which still is DX01. But the window on the right shows the content of the highlighted cartridge, which is ROM 1A. Therefore, I can scroll through the cartridges until I find the one I want. To load this cartridge to make it the active one, I just double-click on it. But I don't have to load a cartridge to use its presets. By double-clicking on a preset, you load the preset into DX. And the good thing is, both sets of presets, which are shown in the lower window and in the window on the right, are on offer. But more about individual presets later. To load another cartridge into the cartridge window is quite easy. Just click the Load button to open your browser, browse to the folder where the desired cartridge is located, double-click it and it will get the loaded cartridge with its content shown in the lower window. To make it a part of the cartridge window, just click Save and give this new cartridge, this set of 32 presets, a name. Now you have to refresh the window by closing the VSD and opening it again. More about refreshing the window later. And here it is. You may want to delete cartridges from the cartridge window from time to time and, more important, you should have a backup somewhere on your computer. Well, physically, the cartridge window is nothing else than a folder on your system disk. Clicking on the button Show Dial or Show Directory gives us the information where it is. Here in the browser I can delete cartridges, for example our latest test card too. As mentioned above, the App Data folder is a hidden one. To handle our cartridge window subfolder, it may be fine to make it visible, even without using DX. So, here is how to do so. Open the Start menu, type in percentage App Data percentage and hit Enter. And here it is. Well, you are in the subfolder Roaming actually, but that's where you get to your cartridge window folder. Open Digital Suburban and DX and Cartridge. Well, but what if I want to save only a single preset? At first, Please work only with copies and never with the original cartridges or folders in this workshop. It prevents you from losing data when making a mistake. I click the Init button to reset the VST to a single sine wave. And modulate this sine wave with another one using a certain amount of attack. 
Let me call this preset First FM Attack. I want to save this preset, so I click the Store button. A new window opens and I can give my preset the wanted name and can determine on which of the 32 places of the actual loaded cartridge I want my preset to be stored. Let's have a look at the other options of the store window. Store program to door plug in song state. This means that the changes of the cartridge's content are only valid with your actual door project or song. Loading the cartridge again from the cartridge window into the lower window by double clicking the cartridge's name or loading the X in another project shows the cartridge unchanged. The option Store Program and Override Current This X Cartridge makes the changes permanent and the formerly stored preset is lost. The option Store Program and Create a New Copy of the This X Cartridge doesn't unfortunately work with my version of the X, but the more important function External File works perfectly. You can store the whole cartridge, including the new preset, anywhere on your hard drives using any name you want. There are some right-click options. Right-clicking on a preset in the lower window in DX and in the Yamaha manual uh, presets are called program allows you to send either the actual preset or the whole cartridge to the DX7 hardware synth. Right-clicking on a preset in the right window only lets you send the preset to the DX7. And right-clicking on a cartridge in the cartridge window lets you either open the Windows browser showing the location of the cartridge's SysX file or send the whole cartridge to the DX7 or lets you refresh the cartridge window so that you don't have to close and open the GUI. What else about the file management and the presets? Well, by clicking in the window with the preset's name, you can quickly jump from preset to preset. All right, the envelopes now. The DX7 and the VST DX have seven envelope generators, each of which has four adjustable levels and four adjustable rates, the later determining how long it takes to get from one level to the next. Each operator contains one envelope generator. Envelope generator 7 is a general pitch envelope for the whole VST. The window showing the envelopes graph is quite helpful, but also a bit misleading sometimes, as the proportions don't always give you the right impression of the time relations. So let the graph give you a somewhat rough orientation and rely on the numbers for the details. But more about that a little later. And remembering the display of the good old DX7, I'm very happy with the graphs of the VST. The graphic shows the different stages of the envelopes. 
Level 4 is a special one, as it is the level the output sustains at even after releasing a key and after a release rate. It is normally adjusted to zero. Let me show you what happens if not. Please count the number of played notes before the sound of the first one, the one with level 4 at a value higher than zero, disappears. It will be 16 following notes. Please watch the VST's keyboard to see when I hit and release the notes. Let me just play around a little to demonstrate the levels and rates before I come to some special behaviors of the envelopes which may be not so obvious. I start with the basic initialized patch. I reduce rate 1 from 99 to 25 to get a kind of attack. The range of the rates and the levels reaches from 0 to 99. With rates, a low number means slowly or longer time, a high number means fast or shorter time. With the levels, a low number means a low level and a high number means a high level. I reduce rate 4 to 25 as well to get a kind of release. By the way, the longest possible time a rate can last is 3 minutes. Amazing 3 minutes. Now I reduce level 3 down to 80 and rate 3 down to 50. At least I reduce level 2 down to 45 and rate 2 down to 50. I have drawn another envelope to show you that the envelope graph window shows us where in the envelope or where in the development of the whole envelope a sound actually is. The shown numbers are the actual level the sound is at and the white dot jumps from stage to stage during the envelope's development. There are three special behaviors of the envelope generators you have to know. You have to know. Sorry. First, rates are faster when rising and slower when decreasing. Please look at the digital clock above while the next experiment is going on. I adjust rate 1 and rate 2 both at 35. By the way, when you move the mouse pointer over a knob or slider, the X shows the adjusted value in the display on the left down corner. Well, let's compare rates 1 and 2 now.
Next aspect to mention. The time rate needs to reach its end depends on the difference of the levels this rate links together. To demonstrate this, I increase level 2 of my last experiment, and you will see and hear that the time rate 2 needs is shorter than. And at last, lowering the output level of the operator speeds up the whole envelope. I insert an amplifier in the, um, in the effect path to let you hear something even with low output levels. Therefore, don't care about the low level high frequencies you see in the spectrum. Reducing the output level of the whole VSD doesn't have any influence on the speed of the envelope generators. Okay, we are leaving the VST now and enter the realm of frequency and phase modulation, FM and PM. Yes, there is a certain amount of theory to take in, but you won't need complicated mathematics, nor will you have to follow a lot of boring theory. To make sure that even complete beginners can take advantage of the following, I give you a very short explanation of the basic terms. The frequency of a cyclical wave, for example a sine wave, is the number of cycles, the number of repetitions per second. The frequency makes the tuning, well, at least mostly. The phase of a wave is the point on the wave's curve where it actually is at a certain moment, in which state it is at the very bottom of the at the very top or at zero or or or. 
the amplitude, what is how high the wave goes up or how far it goes down, again in simple but sufficient words, represents the amount of energy the wave has got. Very often that is the volume or the loudness of the sound. But no sound, except a sine wave, contains only a single frequency. There is always a whole spectrum of different frequencies. The basic frequency, let me call it the boss, or in more professional terms, the fundamental, makes the tuning and the other members of the spectrum make the timber. These other members are called partials, sometimes, uh, sometimes also sidebands. The last term comes from radio electronics. When I change the frequency, when I modulate it and do it slowly, I get a vibrato effect without otherwise changing the sound. But when I increase the modulation's frequency, when I change, modulate, the tone faster, sidebands occur in the spectrum and the sound changes. That is what frequency modulation is all about. Well, basically. Let me show you the relation of two sine waves, one modulating the frequency of the other. My signal analyzer is stereo, therefore I turn the modulating wave completely to the right channel. It is drafted in green. The blue one is the modulated wave on the left stereo channel. Don't care about the VST Basil too much here, the graphs are important. I'll talk about Basil later in this series of workshops. You can easily see what happened to our simple sine wave. Its frequency changes according to the level of the modulating wave. At high positive amplitudes of the modulating wave, the frequency of the modulated wave is high, at negative amplitudes it's low. Well, kind of logical, isn't it? We get more spectacular results when we increase the volume of the modulating wave or when we change its frequency. But more about that later. We have to do away with a problem at first, a problem which is more or less caused by Yamaha themselves. Their famous FM synths are no FM synths at all. They don't use frequency modulation, they use phase modulation, PM. So, what is the relation between FM and PM? What is the difference? Well, FM and PM are twins, or like twins. They are not completely the same, but, well, quite the same. Always, when you change the frequency, you automatically change the phase and vice versa. The red dot in the graph showing the phase at a certain moment is direct from left to right and vice versa in phase modulation. But when you drag the phase, the red dot, to the left, the peaks of the wave on the left of the dot get tighter to each other. There are more cycles per second. More cycles per second, well, is nothing else than a higher frequency. Whereas on the right of the dot, the number of cycles per second decreases, a lower frequency. Ok, ok, this is uh, more an illustration than an explanation, but it answers to what is really going on and what without using, and that without using mathematics. And we see, always, when we change the frequency, we change the phase too, and vice versa. I don't know why Yamaha called their since FM since and not PM since, but, well, they did. So, isn't there any musical difference between FM and PM? Mm, well, there is. Not even twins are completely identical. But in this workshop and in the following four ones, I'm going to talk only about PM, as this is what the sound of the 80s and what the DX7 and a lot of other so-called FM synths are about. In workshop 6, then, I'm going to compare FM and PM. Let's call the modulated wave the carrier and the modulating wave the modulator. This is the commonly used terminology.
obviously there are three important values to consider. The frequency of the carrier, Fc, the frequency of the modulator, Fm, and the output level of the modulator, its strength, its amplitude, Ma. The output level of the carrier is simply the overall volume of the whole sound and therefore not important for our investigations in sound. And to make it even simpler, for most of the tasks we have to do in sound design, it's not the pure frequencies, but the relation of the two frequencies that is of interest. And therefore we can reduce all the fuss about FM and PM to only two values we have to investigate in. The carrier modulator ratio, C to R, and the strength of modulation, MA. Only these two values will preoccupy us for some time. Only, well, you will see, they are well, quite tricky. It's time for some practical work, some real sounds again, don't you think? All right, one of the most important waves in electronic music is the saw wave, because its spectrum contains all even and all odd multiples of the fundamental. Therefore, its sound is very rich. In subtractive synthesis, we apply a filter to a saw wave generator and, well, the rest is history. But we can generate a saw wave using FM as well. We just use a one-to-one -one ratio. To reproduce this with dx, I initialize the VST, use algorithm 1 and only the operators 1 and 2. Operator 1 is the carrier and operator 2 is the modulator. Well, it's a quite poor saw wave with only five partials in its spectrum, well, but it has definitely got the character of a saw wave. I'm going to talk about a richer saw wave later in this series. Increasing both frequencies, the frequency of the carrier and the frequency of the modulator, doesn't change the sound, the wave forms the spectrum, but only the tone, as long as the ratio is still one to one. Let's create sorry, let's create another waveform, important and well known from subtractive synthesis a square wave with only odd multiples of the fundamental in its spectrum. To achieve this, I change the carrier modulator ratio to 1 to 2. And again, the ratio is important for the sound, not the absolute frequencies. Perhaps you haven't completely realized so far, but we have discovered an important rule. The C to M ratio determines the character of the sound, the kind of partials which occur in the sound. And what about the other factor? The strength of modulation, the output level of the modulator. Well, let's find it out. I take a quite queer C to M ratio and start with the highest output level of the modulator. Please watch the high partials vanishing step by step while I turn the modulator's output level down and reappear again when I increase the modulator's output level again. But the spacing of the partials, the basic character of the sound, remains the same all the time. This leads us to rule number two. The C to M ratio determines which partials the spectrum potentially may have, but the strength of modulation determines how many of those partials will actually and really occur. 
and perhaps you have already realized what I have been doing the last minutes. I have been simulating a classic low-pass filter. Turning the modulation strength down corresponds to decreasing the cut-off frequency, increasing the modulation strength correspond, uh, correspondence, sorry, corresponds to increasing the cut-off frequency again. Well, so far about the basic rules, I'm going to introduce some important details to you in the following workshops. Well, we have reached the third part of today's workshop, the third column as I like to call it, analyzing presets, analyzing famous presets. Hmm, but in this first workshop we haven't talked about enough aspects of FMPM yet, nor have I told you about all of the VST's functions. A fully fledged analyze isn't impossible, uh, sorry, isn't possible yet, hmm, but will be from the next workshop on. Therefore, I've decided to proceed reversely today and create a sound, the sound of a plucked string. Create, hmm, well, let me call it an approximation, what we are going to do today. And to avoid a misapprehension, I don't think that a synthesizer's main task is imitating real instruments, not at all, but approaches like the following one are instructive from time to time. Well, let's begin. When we listen to a plucked string, we discover at once that the sound has two main stages. A very short one at the beginning, when I release the string, and a quite long one, a stage with a long release when the string is swinging to and fro, and the resonances from the body of the instrument and the rest of the strings are doing their work. Let me call the first stage the plink stage and the second one the body of the sound. A promising approach is, therefore, to utilize two independent carrier modulator setups. To do so, I have to choose an algorithm consisting of those two modulation chains. I'm going to talk about the algorithm of the X in detail in the next workshop, but I think everybody recognizes that algorithm 1, the algorithm we already know, is of that kind. A string produces all harmonics of the fundamental, meaning frequencies of 2 times the fundamental, 3 times the fundamental, 4 times the fundamental, and so on. The corresponding waveform is a saw wave. But choosing a C to R ratio of 1 to 1, as we did to create a saw wave in the second part of this workshop today, leaves us quite 
far away from how the body of the hurt sound really sounds, the sound of a saw wave is too rich. On the other hand, a square wave, with its spectrum of only odd harmonics of the fundamental, with every second harmonic missing, is obviously too thin, not brilliant enough. Therefore, I should try using a wave with a spectrum of only every third harmonic missing. But huh, how to get it? We don't know yet. But I will talk about things like harmonic structure of FM sounds in the next workshop soon to come. But for now we have to improvise a little. If in a square wave's spectrum every second harmonic is missing, and if a square waves occur, uh, sorry, and if square waves occurs using a C to R ratio of one to two, what about trying a ratio of one to three? And indeed, here we are. Every third harmonic is missing. And, what's even better, the resulting sound resembles the sound we have recorded sufficiently, at least for today. Well, we are prepared to set up the patch now. I initialize the X and start building up the amplitude envelope of the body of the sound. So I decrease the output level of operator 1 to 0 and increase the output level of operator 3 to 99. There is no attack. Of course there isn't. It's a plucked sound. So I leave level 1 and rate 1 at 99. The only volume stage the sound has is a long decrease to 0. Therefore, I set the levels 2, 3 and 4 to 0, as well as the rates 3 and 4. I adjust rate 2 until I find a decrease time I like. So much about the carrier of the body of the body of the sound now. Operator 4 is the modulator of the body sound. I increase its frequency to 3 to get the voltage carrier to modulator relation of 1 to 3 and increase the output level of operator 4 until I approximately get the sound I want. Now for the envelope of the modulation. I think this part of the sound, the part I have called the body, stays more or less unchanged. The modulator's envelope has to be the same as the carrier's, therefore. OK, it's time to set up the plink part of the sound. Again, I start with the volume envelope, but I decrease the output of operator 3 to 0 at first to listen only to the modulation chain operator 2 and operator 1. I sh uh, sorry, the shape of the plink envelope is basically the same as the shape of the body, only that the modulation, the sharpness of the sound, decreases a lot faster. I want this plink part to decrease to a sine-like wave during the decrease of the whole sound. Therefore, I choose even the same decrease time, the same rate to level of 34. The decrease time of the modulator of operator 2 will have to be remarkably shorter then. Well, the modulator of the plink part of the sound now 
I don't increase the output of operator 2 completely to 99 because at the very end of the output scale there occur partials I don't want in the spectrum. I will talk about that phenomenon later in this series. I adjust the modulator's output at 80, same as level 1, the first level of the envelope, level, level 2, 3 and 4 shall be at 0 again, same as rates 3 and 4. The modulation shall fade away quite fast. At rate 2 of uh, 60, I am satisfied by the modulator's envelope. I'm satisfied with the envelope, but not with the sound. It's not at all sharp enough. What is missing are a lot of high partials in the spectrum. Therefore, I increase the frequency of the modulator, testing some, well, let's say, odd carrier to modulator ratios. At C to M, at a C to M ratio of 1 to 21, I'm convinced by the sound. It's time to listen to both components of the sound together, therefore I increase the output of operator 3 back to 99. I'd like the plink part to be a little less dominant, so I decrease the output of operator 1 a little and adjust it at 96. And here are all four envelopes in one graph. To make playing the sound a little more interesting, I want to apply a release phase to the envelopes so that the sound's end depends on when I release the keys. During this release phase, the modulations shall fade away faster than the unmodulated wave. Therefore, I am going to adjust rate 4 at the modulator's envelopes at higher values, uh, sorry, <laughs> higher values than rate 4 of the carrier's envelopes. But hey, playing short notes, I discover there is a mistake. I have forgotten to reduce release to 99. By adjusting rate 4 to 0, I have adjusted it to about 3 minutes. So, back to 99, and then testing some release rates I like.
and a last change. I don't like the modulation of the body part of the sounds to fade away completely when I play short notes. Therefore, I decrease the value of rate 4 of the envelope of operator 4, the modulator of the body sound, to a value smaller than the value of rate 4 of the envelope of operator 3, the carrier of the sound, of the body sound. Well, that's it. Hmm. I haven't used operators 5 and 6 so far. I think that's a pity. So I change the algorithm to algorithm 5. The sound doesn't change because operators 1, 2, 3 and 4 are arranged as before and the output level of operators 5 and 6 are still 0. Hey, but no, ha, the rest shall be your job. Well, that's it. The first part of the workshop is done. Those of you who have registered or will do so can send me their solutions and suggestions, homework 1 to 6, and I will send you a personal comment about your work. The others will have to wait until the next part of this workshop is published in about six weeks. I'm going to show the best or most interesting homeworks at the beginning of the next workshop. You will find more information, material, help and discussions about this workshop on my website www.rofilm-media.net and my forum Deep Sound Diverse Coffee House. On the website you will find all graphics and all sound files sound files of this workshop ready to download for free and if you want to register to get personal coaching even that is for free please visit the contact me page of my website please consider subscribing and liking and perhaps if you have enjoyed this workshop even donating to support my work but mainly have a great day and a good time Rolf.